all around the world, it doesn't matter what plant you're talking about, whether it's chocolate or soy or wheat or corn, the one common thing that they all have to deal with is pollution coming from the sky. Now, starting a garden at home is great, but if you truly want to control all the inputs that are going into the food that you eat, the only game in town is a controlled enclosed greenhouse. In this video, I'm going to share with you some secrets that we've learned about how to operate our greenhouse. And number 18 will shock you. I love the chase and the hunt and I set the pace when I'm running. I always take what I want and I always give it 100. Don't need a bank, no, I'm funded. Play the game like it's nothing. I'm always thankful for something. Don't take for granted, stay humble. Now waiting, better believe in your mind because it's everything. You can mold, shape, find almost anything. Hey everybody, this is Praxis. In this video, I want to talk about the greenhouse that is attached to our house. If you have a dream in your future where you would like to have a greenhouse attached to your house, there are a lot of benefits to that. We're going to talk about some of those in this video. Uh, there are also a lot of things to learn about how to get the thing to operate, how to get it to function to its best uh, capacity. And in this video, I want to share with you some of the lessons that I've learned by having this greenhouse attached to our house. There are a couple of main points that I want to address uh, as we go through this video. Uh, and so I'm going to kind of break it up into sections. The first thing I want to talk about is gray water. We're using gray water to water our greenhouse. And you can see here, we've got this white pipe that comes out of our house up here. And this is where the primary water is coming to water all the plants that are in our greenhouse. It runs down that pipe uh, into this uh, pot here. We've got some uh, charcoal that I've got in there. It's just from outdoor fires. Uh, and I use that to kind of capture some of the chemicals that are coming down uh, from the gray water. The gray water that we're running in here is from our bathroom. It's from our upstairs bathroom. Uh, and that includes our shower water, our sink water, where we like brush our teeth and whatnot, and also the laundry. The laundry machine is up there. Now, uh, in the past, I have run gray water from uh, my kitchen sink. That was at my last homestead. And uh, my experience running the gray water in here has taught me that not all gray water is made equal. The gray water that comes out of here is awfully clean. And because of that, uh, what I found is that the, the track, the, I've got like a little groove that kind of goes along the edge here. Uh, this track has remained uh, relatively open and free and porous. And that was not the case when I was uh, using gray water that was sourced from my kitchen sink. When you're washing dishes in your kitchen sink, there's probably oils going down, there's bits of food going down, and all those bits of food and everything like that, those tend to plug up the soil. Uh, so when you're uh, running water across your soil uh, and you have a bunch of you know, food from your kitchen sink, it tends to plug the soil up and you're going to get a much longer run uh, because it, it almost kind of creates like little shoots for itself. Uh, that's not the case with the water that I've been having coming out of the bathroom. What I've uh, had an issue with here is actually that it just really absorbs into the soil really quickly. You can see all these worm casings here. There's a lot of activity here, a lot of biological activity here, and that has caused the soil to really kind of get churned up. And uh, without my constant attention, the water from here really kind of just stays in this area right here. And it's not running through this entire track that I made for it all the way around here all the way down over here. I've got some little waterfall features uh, where it's gonna, you know, once I get rid of this pile of junk here, there's more garden under there. And we want the water to reach all the way around over there. Now, this isn't a situation where we have to just give up and we have to be like, oh, okay, well, you know, I guess we're only gonna grow plants over here. What I've been doing is I've been kind of renewing uh, the, the trench here. And I've uh, you know, been trying to encourage the water to, to move out in different areas. And I think over time, I'm probably going to end up um, putting some perforated pipe and having it pour into some perforated pipe and get that to get it to run the entire distance. But the reason I bring this up is that if you're planning on using gray water in your greenhouse, uh, know that uh, no, not all gray water is the same. This is something that was a learning curve for me. I you know, presume that since I've been using gray water in the past, I'd kind of know what I was doing. And I did, as long as it's kitchen sink water. But for bathroom water, I'm finding it's a lot cleaner. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's, it's not plugging up the soil, so it, it doesn't run as far. Now, that said, your bathroom water might be different. You may use different soaps. We use a lot of very natural, biodegradable soaps here. Uh, we, you know, we did that before we were ever running gray water. 
So, uh, you know, that might make a difference, uh, you know, based on the type of soaps that you're using, you know, how much skin you might be shedding, you know, how much hair, you know, comes off you. If you're like a super hairy person and like the bottom of your bathtub looks like, you know, the, uh, the back of a woolly mammoth every time you take a shower, you know, maybe all those hairs are going to come, uh, come out and kind of plug up your soil a little more. So, uh, you know, my point here is that whatever you're using for gray water in your greenhouse, if you're using gray water, it's going to be a learning curve and it'll be the sort of situation where you'll kind of see what uh, happens with the setup you've got and you might need to modify it. We've got some vining plants here. These are our German pole beans that are all going up this wall here. Uh, we've got a tomato plant here. Uh, the, this is a citrus tree. Uh, it's a grapefruit tree. Uh, I, I just planted that from a seed, uh, you know, that I, I found in a grapefruit I was eating. I've had that for many years and I figured that, you know, this might be a nice spot for it. We'll see over the winter whether it survives. I don't know whether it will or not. We'll find out. Uh, we've got some wild violets down here, uh, you know, just lots of different uh, kind of weeds. This is, uh, you know, lamb's quarter. It's an edible leaf uh, uh, plant that I uh, like to eat a lot. It's, uh, you know, it's just a weed that grows around here. We've got basil going uh, in here, which I intentionally planted. And we've got a lot of this clover uh, in the center area. This is white, uh, white clover. And... Um, uh, those are the different plants that we have growing in here, and uh, there's been a little bit of a learning curve in terms of, of the plants in here. Uh, the clover is doing all right at the moment. Uh, it seems like it's growing in pretty well. I'm trying not to walk on it too, too much while it's in this young stage. I'm just kind of occasionally trotting on it to give it a little bit of uh, exercise and, you know, uh, growing and regrowing, uh, but uh, trying to go a little easy on that. Uh, this plant here, it's been established for a long time, so I'm not really too concerned about that. But uh, I do want to talk about the tomato plant and the German pole beans. Now the tomato plant, why don't we start with that? Because, uh, you know, I wouldn't say that this tomato plant's doing that great. Uh, and, uh, you know, there's so many factors. There's the soil, there's how much water uh, is in there, there's temperature, there is, uh, you know, airflow, and, uh, you know, the amount of sunlight it gets. And at the moment, because the tomato plant uh, has not set out flowers, and I know uh, tomato plants that I have outside have set flowers, and because it looks so leggy, you know, there's, there's a lot of stem uh, on here, like this whole section right here, it's a lot of stem uh, to, uh, to the leaves, uh, you know, kind of a leaf stem ratio you get going on there. Uh, I'm thinking that it's probably not getting as much sun as it would like. Uh, the way that this greenhouse is oriented, most of the sun just comes through the roof up here, uh, as I'm turning around here, I'm facing kind of in a southeast direction. You can see the south wall, it just has a couple windows. There's a small window there, small window up there. Primarily, uh, primarily the light that's coming into this greenhouse is coming through uh, the ceiling here. And uh, because of the orientation of the greenhouse and the fact that it is up against our house, this wall here is the wall of our house. Because of that, it doesn't really get sun until uh, kind of the second half of the day. And I think that for tomatoes, uh, tomatoes seem like maybe they just want a little bit more sun than is in here. Uh, now, I'm not saying it's a mistake to put a tomato plant out here. You know, maybe it just takes longer. Maybe we eventually get some fruit off of it. Maybe we don't. I think experimentation is good in and of itself. So I'm glad that we, uh, you know, have it out here to, you know, just see how it does. Uh, but this is uh, something where, you know, after this first year, this tomato plant might be something that I decide, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not going to repeat that experiment and I'll, I'll try other plants. Uh, a, a plant that does do pretty well are these uh, German pole beans. Uh, they've done uh, perfectly well uh, given the amount of sun and light and temperature and humidity and water access and everything that they have. Uh, they are, you know, climbing up uh, these little uh, boards that I put on the walls. Uh, one thing that has been kind of a surprise about the German pole beans, though, is that they seem to like to set a lot of their flowers on the back side of those little wooden slats. Uh, as you can see, actually, I've got a better view of it right over here. Uh, these wooden slats are, I think they're like one inch by four inch boards. And uh, they, they're just kind of floating off the wall by, uh, you know, it's about like two inches or something like that. Uh, I did that uh, both to create kind of a climbing trellis for uh, climbing plants. Also, it's a heck of a lot more attractive than just a concrete wall, which is what it used to be there. Uh, but it's been a little bit of a surprise that the, uh, the beans have decided to set a lot of their flowers, not all of their flowers, but an awful lot of their flowers on that backside. Uh, you know, maybe they prefer it. It's a little shadier or a little cooler over there. Uh, but a lot of the vines on the backside are the ones that are setting the flowers. Uh, another thing that's been a little bit of a surprise uh, as regards to flowers on plants is that they're being pollinated at all. Uh, when I uh, initially uh, put these plants out here, I was thinking, well, you know, I'll probably have to open the, the, the door or open the window without the screen to let some bees in here so that the bees
bees can pollinate our flowers, and I found that that has not been necessary at all. They've been being pollinated by something, and I presume that it's just the random mix of flies that we have out here in the greenhouse. Now, uh, when I say that we have flies out here in the greenhouse, it's not a situation where I come out here and you're like swatting at flies and you feel like, uh, you know, it's like, uh, I feel no more protection indoors and outdoors. When you're out here, you don't feel like there's really any flies out here, but there certainly are some. Uh, we can see some of them right down here. I mentioned there's a lot of biological activity going on uh, down here. Here's one of those basil plants right here. Uh, and you can see just kind of crawling along the side of the, uh, the flower pot here. There's lots of little little flies doing their thing. And I suspect between these and you know other similar insects like that that have just been living in the soil, uh, they've been enough to pollinate all the flowers that have been being set out here by this, uh, by this bean plant. Here's a, a flower right here, you know, waiting to be pollinated. Um, so that was a little bit of a surprise for me. Uh, you know, if you're building a greenhouse and you're, you want to grow uh, you know, some kind of a fruit in there, and you are concerned that you know you're not going to have bees in there, so maybe you have to get a beehive and you have to you know take all these additional steps. It might just kind of uh, happen all on, on its own. The only thing that I did to get these flies in here, uh, and they, there might have been you know flies in here anyway, was that I took some compost from outside, uh, just some composting soil, uh, a couple of shovels of it, and I just you know dumped it right around this area to kind of kind of start inoculating the soil because uh, this environment in here was just dry, dry, dry like dust. And I'm going to show you kind of some of the dirt that was in here down at the bottom of these rocks here. You still got a little bit of it. It's just this, you know, dry, dusty, nothing. And it just sat in here dry and baked for several years. And um, because of that, I thought it would probably make sense to bring in some living material. So I brought that in. I'm sure there were some little, you know, worm eggs and fly eggs and other types of insects and microorganisms and all that kind of stuff that's critical for the soil. That was all in there. And because of that, it seems like it solved the pollination problem before I even, uh, you know, had to, had to do anything about it. So I wanted to mention that. So plant selection is something that is going to be important when you design your own greenhouse. And a lot of it is trial and error. You can do research on it. But honestly, I usually think the best thing to do is just, uh, you know, try out different things, throw mud at the wall, and uh, and see what sticks. You know, worst case scenario, you have a plant that doesn't do very well, and uh, you know, the next year you you try something different. The last thing that I wanted to talk about in regards to having a greenhouse specifically that is up against the side of your house is that I think it's a really, really great idea. This wall here goes into our house. We've got a bathroom, uh, like a downstairs bathroom there. It's kind of our entryway uh, over in this direction. On this side, this goes directly to the outside. Uh, and one of the great things about having a greenhouse that is acting kind of like an entryway for your house, uh, one, it makes it so that when you're walking into your house, if it's you know, rainy outside or muddy or anything like that, you can walk through the greenhouse. It's a great place to leave your shoes. We've got uh, shoes kind of tossed down over here. Uh, you can leave all that kind of like mud and slush, you know, like snow and stuff from the winter time. And uh, you have that kind of intermediary environment where you can kind of get suited up and everything. And uh, you're not always bringing that stuff directly into the house. Also, you know, as you open up the door, uh, you know, in the middle of winter, you're not dumping, you know, a bunch of cold directly into your house. You have this kind of buffer area. And even if we're not talking about the idea of human beings going in and out of your house, just the idea of having a greenhouse that's up against your house, it acts kind of like extra insulation. Like I mentioned, this wall here is the wall of our house. Uh, uh, behind these boards that we have uh, on the wall of the house, we have uh, four inches of urethane foam. I forget the R value on that. But uh, one of the great things about having this greenhouse is that the air temperature out in this space, it can be, you know, like zero degrees Fahrenheit outside, maybe even a little bit below, uh, you know, in the nighttime, you can get to like 10 below zero Fahrenheit. Um, the temperature in this greenhouse barely touches freezing. Like the lowest I've ever really seen it in the morning after like the coldest, coldest nights is like, it'll be like 30 degrees out here. And it might be a, a little bit of frost out here. But the idea is that this house is essentially living in a place where it doesn't, you know, it barely gets below freezing. So these walls, they're not losing anywhere near as much heat as they are when it is, you know, cold out on all the other surfaces of the house. Now, the flip side is in the summertime, it can be a little bit extra warm in here. And we did add a vent up to the top, uh, up at the top of the greenhouse there, and we've got a window over here. So a low window on this side, a high vent on that side. 
really helps to move the, uh, the air through and makes it so it's a lot cooler in here so that in the summertime we're not creating kind of the inverse problem where we're having like, you know, you've got a coat on your house in the middle of the summer. The, the, the house wants to, uh, you know, get rid, of the, get rid of this heat and you're, you're surrounding it with heat. So, you know, you have a little bit of a balancing act there. Here in New England, the, what, definitely the bigger issue that we have is trying to stay warm in the winter versus cool in the summer, especially the way that we built our house where it's kind of burned into the earth. It's, you know, it's pretty comfortable all the time here. So uh, it's been a huge uh, benefit to us that on both sides of the house, it's about a, a story and a, a half tall on either side, we have an environment that is nowhere near as cold as it actually gets around here. So if you're thinking about uh, creating a greenhouse for yourself, if you're thinking about having it attached to your house, I highly recommend thinking about it. It doesn't have to cost an arm and a leg if you build it yourself. You can build a basic structure, just get some glazing over uh, on top of it. I'll put a link down in the description to the company where I bought the glazing for this. Uh, if the, the, the panels on the top of this greenhouse are uh, uh, panels that have 11 different chambers in them. They're kind of like little baffles, so there's like an air uh, area and then another piece of plastic and an air area and another piece of plastic and an air area, repeat like 11 times. And uh, the benefit of that is that it creates a lot more insulation. Uh, if you are just gonna have a single sheet of plastic and it does get cold out and you have kind of a humid, uh, humid space in your greenhouse, you can definitely get condensation happening on your ceiling and the condensation will, you know, collect and pool and run down and it'll get into your wall. So you want to uh, have something on your ceiling where you're not going to be getting that kind of condensation uh, going on it, uh, during colder uh, weather because it can cause a lot of uh, issues with like rot in the walls. But whatever type of roofing material you use, I think it's a great experiment to just play with this type of thing. You know, try out different plants inside. Some are going to work, some aren't going to work. Uh, one thing that I learned early on is that having a fan uh, right here, this is an oscillating fan, is a really important thing to have because uh, uh, plants when you grow them in a greenhouse they get really straggly uh, because they you know they're not being tested with uh, you know little breezes and things like that a lot of plants are just used to having those kind of breezes so we introduced this oscillating fan eventually going to be mounting it on the wall instead of having it just standing out in the uh, um, you know middle of the uh, space here but uh, you know that's all comes down to the idea of experimentation trying something out that you're not familiar with and then through trial and error and kind of learning about you know your own specific um, setup for it, like what you built, the way that you specifically use it yourself, your specific climate, you know, there are all sorts of pieces of advice that I can offer you guys, but everybody's gonna have a different structure, everybody's living in a different area, everybody's got different interests in what they wanna plant. So really the best way to learn about how to run your greenhouse is to build one and try it yourself. That's it, thanks for watching. Hey YouTube preppers, if you'd like to see how we built this greenhouse, I have a playlist down in my playlist section that you can check out. Here's a link to it over here where I show you step by step, day by day, everything we did to put this greenhouse together.